great, great job. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is a uh, very happy little section we're reading, isn't it? Uh, okay, first of all, I just need to clear up one thing. Todd, I thought you weren't going to be here today, but you are here. <laughs> well, I, there's a section I might need to scratch. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Good to see you this morning. Well, uh, good morning. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Slade Reinhardt. I'm the Youth Ministry Director here. And uh, this morning is my privilege to bring to you the message from God's Word. For those of you who are new or uh, just visiting, it will help you to know that we are preaching through the book of Micah on Sunday mornings. We've been doing that for about two weeks or so. And uh, the title of this sermon series is Who is Like God? because that's the meaning of Micah's name, as well as one of the, the uh, prevalent themes in this book, which, of course, is a rhetorical question, a way of saying, uh, emphasizing God's greatness and uniqueness, because no one, indeed, is like God. There is no one like Yahweh. So uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and uh, we'll get right to it. Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus, I thank you for this gathering of the body of Christ. Thank you for the blessing of knowing you as our God. Thank you for your holy word, which is able to make us wise for salvation, which is a light to our path, which reveals you to us. By your spirit, Lord, I pray that you would open our minds and hearts to receive your truth. I pray that you would renew us in faith in you and in love for you. In your holy name I pray. Amen. Well, as you heard from the reading, uh, today's sermon is uh, from Micah 7, 1 through 7, so you can go, go ahead and turn there in your Bibles. Just to keep you oriented, we're going to look at the, uh, the chart that shows the structure of this book once again. Uh, it's a, a, there's basically three parallel sections in Micah. Each of them begins with a call to Israel where, where the Lord is calling to Israel and saying, uh, listen up, I have something to say to you, and then that's followed by a pronouncement of judgment where God would expose and describe the sins of the nation as well as a warning about what would come as a result of that. And then each section ends on a high note, ends with, with a word about hope. Now today we're looking at the first half of the final section of the book. In fact, the next week will be the final sermon in this series. Uh, so if I was fancy, I would say I'm giving the penultimate sermon in this. <laughs> but I'm not fancy, so I won't say that. Uh, <laughs> So, so far in the book, three times God has called to Israel, three times God has pronounced, uh, or, uh, yeah, pronounced judgment, excuse me, <clears throat> and twice he's ended with hope, and, and Micah is going to end the book on a joyful note of hope, but before he does that, he takes the time for a dirge or a lament about the sad state of Judah at this time. Now, keep in mind, this is during the days of the divided kingdom when uh, Israel was split into two and the northern kingdom remained, uh, continued to be known as Israel, whereas the southern kingdom, which is where Jerusalem was, was known simply as Judah. And this is where Micah is uh, prophesying out of and to the people of Judah. And so he takes the time in this section to just lament, to sing a sad song about the state of affairs in the nation of Judah. It's, it's, uh, it's as you can see, it sounds bitter. It sounds very... Uh, despairing and discouraging, but uh, it's going to teach us some very uh, beautiful truths. So there are three main points in this lament that I want to bring out, and the first one is this. God's people have turned away from him. This is the thought that dominates this passage, as you heard Bailey uh, reading that. It's a horrible truth that will have horrible consequences. God's people have turned away from him. These people were chosen by God to be his special people, the people that he had revealed himself to, the people that had seen his mighty works on their behalf. They had turned their backs on him brazenly and consistently. Look again at verse 1 with me. Now the way this starts off, Micah is, is giving us a signal here that this is not good news coming because he starts off with, woe is me. Woe is me, a note of despair right at the beginning of this, alerting us that what he's about to say is bad news. There's a bad situation. There's something that you need to be, uh, that's worth being upset about. And then he begins this lament with figurative language. He doesn't come right out and say the situation. He starts off with this, this simile. He says, I have become as 
when the summer fruit has been gathered, as when the grapes have been gleaned, there is no cluster to eat, no first ripe fig that my soul desires. Well, here's what he's getting at. Getting at picture. Uh, uh, let's imagine that you have just had a hard day's work in the field. Okay, this is 700 BC. So you got no John Deere tractor. It's all manual labor. And uh, you're walking home, and you're just famished. And you see an orchard of fig trees. And imagine for a moment that you love figs. <laughs> Anybody in here that likes figs? Fig newtons. I like those. Is that true? Are those real figs? I don't know. So anyway, you're, you're walking and you see this orchard of fig trees, and the sight of those fig trees just really stirs up your craving for figs. And it's summertime, which is when the uh, figs first get ripe, and a first ripe fig is the sweetest, most wonderful kind of fig that you can get. And so you rush down to that field, and you run up to the tree nearest to you, and you look all over it, and there aren't any figs anywhere on that tree. So you go to the next tree, and the next tree, and the next tree, with the same result every time. There are no figs there, and you realize it's already been harvested. I missed it. There are no figs for me here. Well, that's what Micah is trying to get across here. He's saying, that's what it's like with me. It's like someone wanting figs, wanting grapes, but the harvest has happened, and so there's nothing there. There's no cluster of grapes. There are no first ripe figs that my soul desires. So what he's trying to do is set us up to understand his emotional state. There's something that he strongly desires and he looked for it desperately and it wasn't there. An emotional state, of course, of disappointment. Micah said, I'm looking for something desperately and I don't find it. But of course, he isn't looking for figs or grapes. What is he looking for? The next verse explains the point of his simile. Micah is looking for people in Israel that are faithful to God, and he doesn't find any. The first half of verse 2 says, The godly has perished from the earth, and there is no one upright among mankind. Now, Micah is obviously using hyperbole here. He is exaggerating for effect. Surely there were some few in Judah that were still faithful to the Lord. But by and large, the population had turned away from God. And so the, the overall, the dominant spiritual climate was one of rebellion and sin. In fact, it felt like it was so dark that it seemed like everybody that was godly had died. It's like everybody everybody that loves God is dead because I cannot find anybody around here that's following God. Judah had become a place filled with people living in rebellion against their God. And Micah said, finding a godly person is as difficult as finding a fig or a grape after the harvest. Now, it is tempting to look at Micah's situation and then draw a parallel between Israel then and the United States of America now. After all, our country is indeed a moral wasteland, corruption and evil from the top to the bottom, blatant disregard for God, people that flaunt their sin and celebrate their sin. Spiritually, it is true, our society is indeed a dark place. But that is not the most accurate way to connect that passage, uh, this passage to today because... <clears throat> Excuse me, because the United States is not directly analogous to Israel. Israel was a covenant nation. In fact, the only covenant nation in history, Israel was a country that was founded directly by God. The United States of America is not a covenant nation. We were not founded directly by God. And while there is plenty to be righteously angry about in our country, let's think about the situation for a minute. Most of the people in the United States of America are not the people of God. Sin of any kind should be exposed and denounced, but we should not be surprised by the open sinfulness of pagans, which is what most Americans are. Most Americans have no regard for God. Micah's painful burden was that the people of God, the people who knew the revelation of God, the people who knew who the one true God was, those people were living in outright disobedience and rebellion against God. They were living as if God did not deserve their reverence or their obedience. They were living in full-blown wickedness. So the modern parallel to Israel then is actually the visible church today. The, uh, and I'll explain that term. Theologians sometimes speak of the church as there's the church, uh, there's the visible church and the invisible church. The visible church is Everybody that we can see that is part of a church. So everyone that outwardly professes Christ as their Lord. 
But that means that the visible church includes some people who are not actually believers. There are hypocrites in every church who publicly profess faith in Christ, but in actuality do not trust in him. They have never been born again of the Spirit. They have not had their sins forgiven. They've not been adopted into the family of God. So the visible church is a mixed bag spiritually. Not everyone in every church is a true believer. The invisible church refers to all true believers on earth and in heavens. And, and that, that roster, if you will, is known only by God. Only he knows the identity of everyone in the invisible church. Now, Israel was the visible people of God in that day. They were the ones that God had set apart. You are my people, make a covenant with you. You are the ones who will represent me to the world. And just as in the visible church today, not everyone is a believer. Not everyone in Israel was a believer either. But because they were associated with the nation of Israel, they did represent God to some degree to the nations around them. So Micah was lamenting the rampant sin among those who knew of God and his commands. See, even these people that were completely abandoning any, any respect or reverence for God, they did know the truth. They were taught it from childhood. Uh, they would be taught the scriptures, they would, be, they would learn the law, they would hear about what God had done for the nation of Israel, how he had delivered them, how he had split the Red Sea, how he had conquered the, uh, the nations before them, and all of that, they knew all of that. So these are not people that are spiritually ignorant, that are raised in some pagan home. These are people who knew who the real God was, and yet they were living in open rebellion against him, and that was what was so painful for Micah. His summary description is terrible. He says, they all lie in wait for blood, and each hunts the other with a net. There was such disregard for others that they looked for ways to destroy each other. They had no love for their neighbor. They were violent, violently committed to their own self-interest. It was like they were willing to kill in order to get what they want. It didn't matter who needed to be sacrificed for their desires to be fulfilled. All right, so let's bring this into the modern day. So here we are with the visible church. Fellowship Bible Church is one of the visible churches in this world. Have you seen this in this church or elsewhere? Have you ever been hurt by another person who professed Christ? Have you ever been had your, debt, your reputation damaged by someone slandering you that called on the name of Jesus? If that is the case, you do have my sympathy. I think most of us probably have had that experience and I know that it is doubly painful when someone will stand up on a Sunday morning and sing praises to Christ and th then turn around and treat you as if you're worthless or if you're just to be used for their own advancement but before I go on I want to get just a little bit more personal so everybody buckle up Think about yourself. Now, I know probably most of us in here have been hurt by someone. Actually, I'm sure all of us have been hurt by someone because we're, we're sinful people and we live among sinful people. But ask yourself this. Have you ever hurt someone in order to get what you want? Have you talked about someone to make them look bad in order to make you look good? Have you neglected your family in order to advance your career? Have you used other people in order to get what you want? See, I think Michael is trying to put his finger on this sin so that it will drive people to repent, drive people to recognize what they're doing is wrong and ungodly, and we need to do the same. And by the way, if you are guilty of any of these, confess that to the Lord, and you know what will happen? You'll receive his forgiveness and then have the opportunity to make amends for those, with those you've wronged. All right, so after this general description of the state of the nation, uh, Micah elaborates give us a fuller picture. Look at verses 3 and 4. This first clause here, their hands are on what is evil to do it well. It's almost humorous because Micah is basically saying, man, these people are skilled at doing evil. They are really good sinners, and they are just working at it with all their might. It's like somebody trying to uh, learn a craft like woodworking, and so they're staying up late, and they're studying, and they're, they're uh, you know, a uh, forsaking sleep and fatigue and that kind of thing in order to get better at that. And Mike is like, this is how these people are with sin. They're willing to be inconvenienced. They're willing to sacrifice in order to become better at doing evil. What a horrible, horrible picture. And then he adds that the leaders of the nations, excuse me, the leaders of the nation, the judge and the prince, they ask for bribes. They see their positions of authority and power as opportunities to get wealthy rather than opportunities to serve those 
on behalf of the Lord, to serve the people they're over on behalf of the Lord. They should have been concerned for justice, for equity, for righting wrongs, and instead they pursued their own enrichment. And notice that it doesn't say that they were tempted to, to, to uh, take a bribe. It doesn't say that they accepted bribes. It says they asked for bribes. They were pursuing bribes. They were pursuing evil. It wasn't a matter of this came along and I gave into it because it was a temptation. It was a matter of I want myself to be enriched. I want my power to grow. And so I'm going to go out there and look for ways in order to make that happen, whether it's right or wrong. They don't care that they're perverting justice. They don't care that they're hurting the people they're supposed to protect. The bottom line is they don't fear God, and so they openly dishonor his name by going after other bribes. The leaders of the nation were pursuing sin, and in addition to that, they were in league with the wealthy and powerful in their nation. It says further that the great man utters the evil desire of his soul, thus they weave it together. In other words, the wealthy and the powerful would tell the judges and the princes, this is what I want to happen. This is how I want to enrich myself, increase my lands, increase my property. This is what I want to happen. And the judges and the princes would take bribes from them and make sure that it, it, make sure that it happened. Can you see the hopelessness the common man would face in this time? The wealthy have evil desires, so they bribe government leaders to help them accomplishment. And working together, of course, they would accomplishment. Now, I will remind you again, I know... I know it sounds just like our nation and many other nations in the world. And indeed it is, right? That is a picture of the highest level of corruption. It's a picture of people betraying the trust that was given to them and abusing the people that they're supposed to be helping. But let me remind you that among pagans, that is to be expected because they do not have a moral anchor. What Micah is hurting so badly about is this is happening among people who say, yes, Yahweh is my God. I am a believer in God. So again, the parallel would be in the church today, leaders in the church today abusing their authority and uh, walking in open sin. You can imagine Micah just spitting out the sentence at the beginning of verse 4. I love the way Bailey read this. The best of them is like a briar, the most upright of them a thorn hedge. These influential people, said Micah, they're no better than thorns. They're dangerous. They're harmful. They don't help. And these are the best ones. It's almost like Micah saying, look, this is the best I can say about them. I, I don't even have words to describe the worst of this lot. The best among them is like a thorn. The immoral actions of these leaders in Judah remind me, speaking of parallels to today, of pastors who use their influence to build wealth for themselves at the expense of the people under their leadership. You see them sometimes on television, maybe you hear them on radio, men and women who manipulate their congregations and those listening to them to give money to support their lavish lifestyles. They promise financial freedom and material prosperity and physical healing and restored relationships in exchange for money. Now they don't say it as blatantly as that, but they will tell people that if you give to their ministry, then God will answer their prayer. It's ungodly. It's sinful. These people are briars and thorn hedges, and they should be called to repent. So after this terrible condemnation, uh, Micah then mentions that punishment is coming for these sins, but I'm going to get to that later, because for now I want to continue Micah's overall judgment that uh, the people of God have turned away from him. So let's look at the rest of what he had to say about the unfaithfulness of God's people, verses 5 and 6. Now here... I mean, if you thought it was bad, right, you got the leaders of the nation, you got the influential, the wealthy people of the nation, they're pursuing their own way without any regard or, or uh, fear of God, and therefore just abusing and uh, unjustly treating the people underneath them. But it gets worse. It's tragic enough that those people were immoral, but Micah says you can't trust your neighbors, you can't trust your friends, you can't trust your own family in Judah in these days. Those with whom you have the closest bonds can't be trusted because everyone has turned away from God. Commentator Stephen Dempster says, if any reader of the book had doubts about the moral wasteland of ancient Judah, those doubts are now put completely to rest. So Micah starts with got the farthest close connection and then moves inward. He starts off with neighbors. He says, you can't trust your neighbor. Don't put your trust in a neighbor. Think about how bad that would be. Your neighbor knows your habits. Your neighbor knows when you're home and when you're not. Your neighbor knows when you bought a new four-wheeler or a new bass boat. 
I have not bought either of those. Just <laughs> neighbors. So your neighbor, among all the people around, your neighbors would be the ones most able to exploit your vulnerabilities. They know that your back gate lock is broken, or they know that you don't really have an alarm system. You just have a sign in your front front yard. And so you're, <laughs> you're, uh, you're at your most vulnerable there. And Micah is saying, in this day in Judah, because of the immorality that's so widespread, you can't even trust those people that are living right next to you. It's a very dangerous time to try to make it through the world. Everybody's looking out for themselves, and they're not living in the fear of God. So a neighbor was just as likely to steal from you or harm you as some unknown criminal. And then he adds, adds excuse me, have no confidence in a friend. It just keeps getting worse. It's like Micah saying, you know your friend Liz that you meet with for coffee every Tuesday, the one you listen that listens to your problems and tries her best to help you? Don't trust her. He's saying you can't even trust your friends because the moral anchor that is tying people to look out for others and to truly love others has been cut. People have completely abandoned God. They're not living in any way with respect to him. And so you cannot trust your friends. You can't trust your neighbors. And even that, you cannot trust your own family. Guard what you say to your wife. The son's against the father, the daughter against the mother, daughter-in-law against the mother-in-law. A man's enemies are in his own house. So here we get to the ultimate betrayal. The people who are absolutely closest to you in the land of Judah at this point, you can't trust them. Because, again, they have abandoned trust in God because they have abandoned obedience to God. There are no limits to what they might do. The apostasy of the nation finally ended in rupturing the family bonds themselves. Now, as an aside, you may recognize this uh, last phrase because Jesus quotes it in Matthew 10, talking about the coming days after his ministry when the gospel would divide homes. So he was, he was telling his followers that, you know, there's going to come a time when you may stand up and say, I trust in the Lord, and then your father turns against you, your mother, your daughter, that kind of thing, uh, which is different than the reason Micah is talking about. Micah is saying this is happening because the nation has turned away from God. In Micah's case, the cause of the family strife was defection from faith in God, which resulted in everyone putting themselves first. Now, can you imagine a family where no one puts others' needs ahead of themselves? Can you imagine a family where nobody is willing to help out anybody else? It would be a living hell, and that is what Micah is describing. No one would care about what they said or did and how much it hurt other people. It would simply be living torture. It's like Micah is saying, sleep with one eye open and keep your pistol near because you can't trust anybody. The nation had turned from God, so now they were running headlong into greater depravity. God's people have turned away from him, Micah said, and because of that, punishment is certain. Excuse me, judgment is certain. By the way, I, I, let me just say, as a, as a spark of hope, this will end in a high, on a high note. So I know y'all are probably feeling low right now. Just stick with me. Here's one of the terrible consequences of Judah's forsaking of God. In addition to the violence, the injustice, and the breakdown of families, they have to contend with the coming judgment from God. The second half of verse 4 says, The day of your watchman, of your punishment, has come. Now their confusion is at hand. The watchman in the verse, this verse probably refers to Micah and other faithful prophets of God. A watchman in those days would be a person who would be stationed on the wall of a city so that he could be uh, looking out and watching for any approaching danger. So prophets of God were sometimes called watchmen because that's what they were doing in a spiritual sense. They were looking out for the, uh, the good of the, the land they're prophesying to and warning of approaching danger. And Micah and his contemporary prophets had been telling Judah for some time, judgment is coming Unless you turn around, judgment is coming. And Micah says, okay, it's here now. It's right at the door. Judah's disregard for the covenant commands would have consequences. Just as God was faithful to fulfill his promise of blessings when Israel obeyed him, he would be faithful to fulfill his promise of curses when Israel forsook him. He had promised to punish Israel if they strayed from him. So now he would make good on that promise. Now, applying this truth to today requires us to keep in mind those categories I mentioned earlier, the visible and the invisible church. If you are a professing Christian, but not a true one, or if you've not trusted in Christ, but you are a regular attender of this church and you present yourself as a believer in Jesus, then you do face God's punishment. 
And it's a punishment much worse than what Judah was about to face. It's a punishment much worse than being conquered by a foreign land. It's, in fact, eternity in hell if you die outside of Christ. It's the most horrible truth in Scripture, but you need to hear it. You need to check yourself and ask yourself, have I trusted in Christ or am I just someone that's posing as a believer to fit in? John 3.36 says, whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of of God remains on him. God in his grace and his mercy has provided a rescue. He provided his son Jesus who took your punishment for you because he is the son of God. He paid the price for your sin on the cross and then rose from the dead. And if you believe that, if you trust in that, then that punishment will be taken away and you'll be moved from just the visible church to the invisible church. Now, if you are truly a believer, you have trusted Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, then you will never, ever, ever face punishment for your sins because all of the punishment that your sins deserve, the sins you have committed, that you committed today, and the ones you commit in the future, all of that punishment was poured out on Jesus Christ. Amen. So if you turn away from God, what the Bible calls backsliding, sometimes you get cold in your faith and you just start drifting away. You start putting distance between you and God. If you do that, then God will bring discipline into your life, loving discipline, to bring you to repent, repentance. But it is not punishment. God is not making you pay for something that you did. If you trust Christ, everything that you have done wrong has been paid for. It was laid upon Jesus on the cross. So it is not punished. God never punishes his children. But he will discipline. He will allow painful things to come into your life in order to draw you back to him, in order for you to see the seriousness of your sin, in order to grow in holiness, as Hebrews 12, 10 says. But it is not motivated by God's desire for vengeance. It is motivated by God's fatherly love. All right, back to Micah. Because God's people have turned away from him, judgment is certain. But in spite of this sad state of affairs, Micah has a source of hope. And here comes a sunburst in the blackness of space. He ends his lament with this beautiful life-giving truth. The Lord is the only one who can be trusted. The people who claim God as their king, the people who claim to be the true worshipers of God, have run enthusiastically away from him into immorality and selfishness and sin. And that was disheartening for Micah, but he turned his attention from these fools back to the only one who was always true, and that is Yahweh. Look at verse 7 with me. But as for me, says Micah, okay, this is the state of my society. These are the people of God. They're running away from him. And it's horrible. But as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Micah saw the widespread apostasy among the people of God, vividly described their sinful ways, but then he turned his focus back to his God who is faithful and holy. David Guzik, an author I ran across, he notes that even though this is a bad thing, that no one can be trusted because of their apostasy against the Lord, God uses it as a good thing because it forces people to put their trust in the only one who can never let them down. One of the... Uh, that, that's really an example of Romans 8, 28, right? God using all things to work together for the good of those who love him or are called according to his name. One of the exercises that I tried to pass on to my uh, sons, or my oldest son, because he and I share a love for football, is this. Uh, and I apologize for using a sports metaphor two sermons in a row. But uh, one of the things I have learned to do, you guys know I'm a Cowboys fan, okay? So when the, uh, pray for me, <laughs> when the... Uh, <laughs> When the Cowboys win, I can say, praise God for that. That was, that was great. It felt good. It was wonderful. Man, I really enjoyed that. But when they lose, I can say, God, thank you for this reminder that you never lose, that you're always faithful, and you're the only one that I can put my hopes and dreams and trust in. And that's what Micah is saying. Okay, all my nation is going to hell, headlong, rushing there as hard as they can, but I'm not trusting in them I'm turning my trust to the God of my salvation. I'm turning my trust to Yahweh. He will hear me. He will save me. People will let you down. Even the people of God will disappoint you and hurt you. 
Micah's exhortation would be to turn your heart, your focus, your trust to the Lord. Look to Jesus. Look at his perfect life. He never disobeyed God. He never grew cold in his love for God. He never thought or said or did anything that was less than what was perfect and righteous. He was tempted in every way that we're tempted, but without sin. And that's why he can be trusted completely. Remember when he was in the desert being tempted by the devil? He was faithful. Remember when he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, let this cup pass. I don't want to face what is coming, the cross and the wrath of God being poured out on me. But he was faithful. He said, God, not as I will, but as you will. And remember when he was arrested and all of his friends ran. He didn't give up. He didn't call down those legions of angels to destroy those Romans that were arresting him. He was faithful to what God had called him to do. And that's why he can be trusted. He alone can be trusted. If you see immorality among the people of God, if you see widespread defection from the faith, look to the Lord. He's the only one who can be trusted. And that's really the point of this message. Trust in the Lord no matter who turns away from him. Professor Ian Duguid said this about the Old Testament. The central thrust of every passage leads us in some way to the central message of the gospel. In this passage, the sad reality of the people of God enthusiastically turning from him is contrasted with the happy reality that God is trustworthy and he will save. In the message of the gospel, the sad reality of all people enthusiastically turning away from God is contrasted with the happy reality that Jesus Christ is faithful and trustworthy and he will save. Everyone will fail except Jesus. He can be trusted. He accomplished the work of salvation. He won the battle against sin and Satan. Now, most of us in this room will not face the situation that Micah did. The only parallel I can think of is if you were in a church and the entire church basically stopped trusting God. That's highly unlikely, uh, thank the Lord. But everyone in here will face times when someone who professes Christ lives in open sin or turns away from God openly. And that can shake you, especially if it's someone who is near and dear to you. Let this prophet's dirge remind you that no matter who turns away from the Lord, a close friend, a respected pastor, a spiritual mentor, you can still trust the Lord. Now, God's word demands a response in some way or fashion. So I've, I've come up with a few for you. You can uh, find those on the tear-off uh, card on your bulletin. First, I would suggest is this, praise the Lord for his faithfulness. No matter how dark it looks, my friend, God is still in control. God still loves you. God will not forsake you. He will not cast you away. He will hear you, and ultimately, you will be saved. A second response would be to ask the Lord to strengthen the faith of backsliding believers. All of us know people that, as far as we know, are true believers in Christ, and they've strayed. Maybe dropped out of church, living in open sin in some way, angry at God for something or another. They're backsliding. They're falling away from God. Pray for God to strengthen their faith. Pray for him to draw them back to him. And finally, look for opportunities to tell others of the Lord's faithfulness. Look back on your life and look at those high points where God came through for you in some desperate need. When God did for you what no other power in the universe could have done. And tell somebody about that. Reminding yourself of that strengthens your faith in the Lord as well as strengthening the faith of other people. Prayer team, uh, you can come forward now. We uh, have a few people that will be up front that are available to pray with you and for you. If you're facing something difficult, if you're uh, struggling spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally, they would be more than happy to pray with you, uh, pray to the Lord on your behalf. If you don't know the Lord, I invite you to come to talk to one of these people up front. They would be thrilled to talk to you about trusting Christ and entering the invisible church. All right, let's all stand. Lord God, in the name of your precious son, Jesus, I want to thank you for this word that you have given. It was a black and horrible time in the history of Judah, but there was still hope because you are still the king, because you are faithful. You are the God of our salvation. 
Lord, I pray that every believer in here would be strengthened in their faith, would be renewed in their love towards you. I pray that you would well up joy within them, Lord, as they look upon maybe the black situation of our nation's politics or or the uh, uh, unfaithfulness among their family or friends. I pray, God, that they would look to you and be filled with joy that you are faithful, that you are true, that they can stand on you as a solid rock. And Lord, I pray that if anyone in this building does not know you, you would convince them that judgment is coming. But you have provided a way of escape. You have provided a substitute for them. You have provided life and forgiveness for all who will come. God, I ask for your blessing on everyone who is here this morning. A special measure of grace for their faithfulness to the house of God. In your holy name I pray. God bless you all. You are dismissed. Have a great Thanksgiving week.